little mini talks. And uh, uh, first, I want to give you an over overview, a bit of an overview of uh, some of the stuff we've been doing with STEMI over the years in terms of the evolution of our program. Um, and then Marla has picked out some nice cases that were that originated from here, so we can talk about individual cases you may have been in, in, involved with, and show you uh, the EKGs and the angiogram correlates and the outcomes of those patients. And uh, I also have a, a little mini course on ECG reading for STEMI that uh, a lot of EMS people have found useful to, uh, to hear about. Um, so let me get started. <coughs> Okay, um, just to give us a, give you all an overview, and I'm sure you, you're all familiar with these maps more, more than I am. Um, but uh, uh, so here we are down at St. Vincent Hospital here, and these red lines are fanning out to the areas that where we receive most of our ST elevation MI, and uh, and uh, I threw in um, times here, the yellow numbers of times by air and by ground based on uh, cases that we actually had. So this is not just calculated from, you know, uh, routes or whatever. This is a marvelous summary. And that's why I think uh, we have a situation where um, uh, you see that the time here was actually shorter from Ocean Beach Hospital uh, than from Astoria for reasons I, I don't really understand by driving. Um, so maybe you all have some insights into that. Uh, so we have Tillamook down here. We get patients from Seaside, Astoria, Queen Memorial Hospital, Loco, and then up here St. John's, we'll get a couple every now and then. Most of these go to OHSU. We get some that uh, have, uh, where the patients want to come to us where they have our, our uh, doctors that are involved in their care. Uh, we get the, these, these patients are really in a different category. These groups are in a little different category. Newburgh, which has really stellar record times in terms of transfer we virtually uh, eliminated all lytic therapy in Newburgh because the, the from their door to our uh, balloon time has been under 90 minutes, or close to 90 minutes without lytic therapy. And I, I can still remember talking to them in the beginning phase where they they didn't believe that that could ever happen. They they they, never, they thought there was no role for primary angioplasty when we first started with them. Uh, but the, generally, these areas that are within 30 minutes, they're they're really primed for. Uh, for primary angioplasty for uh, acute myocardial infarction. Here, uh, Willamette Valley Medical Center in McMinnville, we get a few people from there. We get a few people from Oregon City. Some of these people go to Providence, Portland, um, uh, uh, and Providence, Milwaukee, tends to go to Providence, Portland. Um, the, the American College of Cardiology guidelines uh, basically point out that uh, you know, the goal for primary angioplasty is to get the door to balloon time <clears throat> within 90 minutes. And, uh, and in patients, semi patients that have been to the hospital does not have PCI capability, and PCI would be percutaneous coronary intervention for those who are not familiar with that abbreviation. Um, uh, if, if they cannot get this uh, 90 minute time, uh, they really, uh, uh, they recommended to patients get fibrinolytic therapy. <clears throat> And, uh, and and then be transferred. So uh, uh, there's some more discussion that can go along with that, but I wanted to show you uh, the way these guidelines are broken down. The level one is really uh, really should be done. A and B refers to the level of evidence supporting these uh, guidelines. So standard of care be there. Um, we you know in the beginning phase of our uh, heart attack uh, situation down at St. Vincent Hospital. There's all kinds of barriers we had to get patients done in time. In the early days, you know, they, the ER would call the primary care doctor before they'd call the cardiologist to see what they wanted and what they wanted to do. And we broke down those, uh, those barriers and, and uh, set it up so we could uh, direct, get involved directly. But even, uh, it, it, even when we got through that, we still had issues that people didn't know who to call and they didn't know if the bed would be there. It was very frustrating uh, when you call to get a patient with a heart attack to your hospital and you'd wait for a call back to hear if a bed was involved. And you didn't know what number to call. Uh, if you call the doctor's office, the doctor you know. If you call the transfer center, if you call the general number, if you call the ER, 
it was unknown. So we have created the hotline uh, number you may all be familiar with now. This is St. Vincent's hotline. Uh, this is staffed by uh, CCU hotline nurses, and these nurses are highly motivated nurses who take their job very seriously, and they're really anxious to get um, cardiologists on board and to get the patients there and get them plugged in immediately. Um, they, they have a set of script, scripted questions, very few scripted questions to keep it simple. I'll show you that script. And that uh, they know who to contact with regards to an interventionist, so they'll take care of that piece of it. And um, uh, they, uh, they also activate our operator and our emergency room to notify them what's happening. And uh, they actually uh, serve as a surrogate for the doctor to allow transfer to be initiated before the doctor calls back. Uh, and that's important because you know every we want to gain every minute we can in the transfer process. We want to get the the transfer moving even before the doctor calls back. The, and so, the Dr. Wilson, yes, just so that folks know, because I saw you writing that number down. <laughs> the hotline is designed to uh, facilitate communication between the ED and the uh, receiving, you know, cardiologist. So. You know, if the EMS calls the STEMI hotline, what they're going to say is, they say, you just need to go ahead and let our ER know that you're on the way in. Um, if they get a call from the EMS provider, unless of course the ED has met at the at the helicopter pad like we did, and we're able to say, okay, Ocean Beach says, okay, they're on their way with the STEMI, then of course they would be calling the STEMI hotline. But the EMS providers, that's not your source to activate. It's, it's, it's through the ER, if, if they haven't been seen by an emergency room physician. Does that make sense? Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, I, I should have pointed that out. And uh, some of these things will come up on questions later, perhaps. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, when the hotline nurse calls the interventionalist, they uh, get this limited information. They then call back the, the, uh, the hospital of origin, talk to the physician there, <coughs> find out details about the patient's history, anterior, inferior, what's the EKG look like, what are the patient's uh, risk factors, whatever their specific situation, their hemodynamics, are they in heart failure, do they have bone branch block, all these things, the doctor will, will get that information. Even if the patient was in route by that time, we could get that information. And, and we're allowed to do that because we have the uh, no divert policy now. Uh, we, we have a bed available for that patient. Um, so uh, EMS, when they transfer the patient, when they get to, to our hospital, traditionally the, the EMS was instructed to give, uh, bring the patient to the CCU. And, and this is an area of great confusion for a couple of reasons. Uh, some centers take patients directly to the cath lab, including our centers at time. We, we have decided to have patients come to the CCU initially uh, as a destination because we want to make sure our team is ready to go that the room is set up, there's not something, some other barrier, and uh, we also want, uh, if, if a patient's had a lytic therapy, we can take a moment to assess whether the patient has reperfused, if they're pain-free, STs look like they're down, uh, we may spark that patient in bed and study them either later in the day or the following day. Um, there is data support that uh, if, you, if you take every lytic patient right to the cath lab routinely, that they have a higher risk of problems. But if you're selective in those patients, you do better if you have patients that are not very profuse to go to the lab. So we usually leave them right on the gurney and we, we take a look at them. If they've not had lytic therapy, lab's ready to go, we don't take them off the gurney right over to the lab. They just get moved over. If, uh, if uh, they've had lytic therapy, we check the EKG right when they're on the gurney so we don't waste time moving the patient back and forth and then uh, decide if they go to bed or go to the cath lab. Um, this has become a little bit confusing because at St. Vincent right now, we've had some trouble uh, with the location of our CCU. So the, the neo, right now, the neonatal intensive care unit is being remodeled. They shut down CCU, so neonatal care with CCU. We moved down to the cardiac recovery unit, uh, which is where the post-op heart surgery patients are. And so that's a combined kind of unit. We have another area of our interventional recovery unit that has some CCU designated beds. So it's a little confusing. and. Uh, I don't want uh, our EMS people to get caught in the trap, and we're really working on trying to have kind of a team escort to help uh, get the patients to the right spot. Um, that, that depends quite a bit on um, our ER uh, being notified when, we're, when you're all close, like when you're 10 or 15 minutes out, if we know we can have an escort waiting there to help take you to the right place that you need to go. 
Any questions about that? Uh, our Heartline script uh, is very simple, standardized. People shouldn't get mad at the nurses for asking these questions. These are standard questions. So name, date of birth, where are the patients coming from, the physician in the ER who's kind of in charge, and a number to call back so they can tell the doctor to call. Uh, we put this in a while ago, uh, Kaiser or non-Kaiser, because it, it, it may determine a little bit of what we do and who gets the patient when the patient arrives. Or uh, Kaiser used to be part of our, um, our hospital in terms of taking uh, the interventions were part of our hospital. They now have, uh, they've moved out, but we still care for Kaiser STEMIs that come to our uh, hospital. Um, we like to know if they come back air ground so we can plan to have our team come in, and especially out here. Uh, if I, have, if I call, as soon as I get the call, if I call my team and say, come on in, then they might be waiting an hour and 15 minutes uh, or so. Uh, and if the, the better time we have uh, in, in estimating when the patient's going to get there, the, the better I can tell them uh, to be there at the right time. And uh, this, this, this scripted uh, nurse will also ask if there's a cardiology preference site. Like someone might know this is a patient of Dr. So-and-so's. He's, he had a stent two weeks ago, and he's come back with a heart attack. We try to plug that patient into the right doctor. But there is always somebody on call. There's 24-7. There's an interventionist on call for STEMI. We don't want to get people hung, hung, hung up on this. If, if a doctor who's not in my group uh, gets a STEMI, they will take care of the patient. They'll contact us. We'll work it out. So it's not your problem. Uh, it's really something we can handle if there's any confusion later. Um, just to give you a uh, history, and, and you probably all know this by now, how, how big of an impact field AKGs have had on, on our times. Uh, if you look back here, 2002 up to 2010 here, broken down by quarters. But uh, uh, you, you see these times start to jump downward when we start bringing field AKGs <coughs> as part of our uh, triage method here. And, and uh, our, in the 2010, you see that the, these door to balloon times um, are for all cases are quite quite amazingly low, 59, 63 minutes, and uh, uh, and very competitive with the, some of the best centers in the. In, in 2010, the, the final was 58. 58. Yeah. Nice. And uh, we can see we could break it down even further if we look at uh, time treatment on call versus in house. So there's a slight advantage if we have the team in house and, and the patients come in. You can see we get uh, these are you know average times. Of, 49 minutes in some cases in that quarter. So that's really, uh, really uh, mainly responsible, mainly due to the fact that you guys get EKGs and we activate the, the system. We know there's a semi coming in, team gets ready, doctor gets ready, and 